Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Stuart Pettis on behalf of the Air Force Association. It is my dis very distinct pleasure to host today's panel on special operations in the pure fight. We are very privileged to have two outstanding airmen with us here for our discussion. Lieutenant General Jim Slife is a 1989 graduate of Auburn University. He is, uh, uh, has over 3,100 flight hours in multiple aircraft. Lieutenant General Tony Bauernfeld is the Vice Commander, Air Force Special Operations Command. The general has, is a 1991 distinguished graduate of the United States Air Force Academy and has 3,500 hours in multiple aircraft. Gentlemen, the, to get started, are there going to be any significant changes in SOCOM in AFSOC now that the nation has shifted its focus to, from counter VEO to uh, great power competition? Thanks. So let me start by saying two things. First of all, um, you people need to get a life. <laughs> I brought a major with me so I would have an audience of one, and I can't believe all of you think that this is the most exciting thing going on here right now. So I would just tell you, you probably need to get a life. Number two, uh, joint, all domain, uh, multi-capable AI. Just want to get that out of the way right up front uh, so we can move on with uh, talking about uh, all the other things. So. Um, you know, your question, Stuart, was uh, do we see any changes as we, you know, move to the next operating environment? And I would tell you, uh, the answer is absolutely yes uh, in some ways. Um, what's not going to change is that at the center of our value proposition, and, and I think General Bauernfein uh, would say the same on behalf of all of U.S. SOCOM, but uh, certainly for, for AFSOC, the center of our value proposition uh, is the airman in AFSOC. That is not going to change. That has been the thing that has been our competitive advantage since uh, the very first Air Force special operations were conducted uh, back in the 1940s, and none of that is going to change going forward. Now, are the ways that we do it going to change? Absolutely yes. Um, you know, AFSOC is blessed uh, from a hardware perspective to operate the, the newest fleet of airplanes of, of any MAGCOM in the Air Force. I mean, essentially every platform in AFSOC is a post 9-11 acquisition uh, uh, for AFSOC. And so we've got some great tools. Uh, the analogy that I would sometimes use is, you know, sometimes when you um, uh, are going to eat dinner, you go to the grocery store and you get the buggy and you walk down the aisles and you say, you know, uh, ribeye, potato, um, asparagus, key lime pie, bottle of wine, and you go ring it up and then you go make the dinner you want. Sometimes what you do is you go home and you open the refrigerator and you stand there and stare at it. And then you open the cabinet and you stand there and stare and, and you try and figure out what am I going to make with the ingredients that I have. And I would tell you that this is a, this is a place in time where AFSOC is looking at what is in the kitchen and figuring out new recipes to make with the ingredients we have, because we've got great ingredients. Uh, we've got capable platforms. We have the best airmen uh, that I could ever ask for. Uh, we just need to think about the recipes we make a little bit differently. So yeah, there's going to be a lot that changes as we think about our value proposition going forward. But what's not going to change is that at the heart of it, it's all, it's all about the airmen. Uh, thank you, uh, General Slife. Um, from SOCOM's perspective, I want to double down. On behalf of General Clark, absolutely, the number one priority is always our teammates, soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, that are out there making the mission happen every single day. And there's a little bit of this concept that great power competition or strategic competition is new to SOCOM. But we have to remember that SOF was born in great power competition. That was really when we saw our growth come about. And yes, the last two decades have been laser focused on counter VEO operations, but I would offer that since 2018, when Secretary Mattis put the NDS out, to start focusing again on great power competition, strategic competition, now integrated deterrence, that that is when we started pivoting. And it's so calm alone in an operational perspective, in, 20, or in FY22, over 30% of our operations will be against great power competitors to assure allies, to make sure we're out preparing the environment, to make sure we are forward where we need to be to have the effects to provide the options that the nation needs. 
And I will tell you, as we go into 23 and 24, that needle is going to continue to swing for all of our legislated missions. As an example um, of one of our missions that has been a big point lately in uh, great power competition is information operations. Last year alone, over 40% of our information operations were in missions against um, great power competitors. So from an operational perspective, not only is change going to happen, but change has been happening since 2018. Now let me talk to you about where we're going with modernization. On a modernization front, that change has also been happening. Since 2018 to 21, SOCOM has spent about $13.2 billion modernizing our force across the enterprise for great power competition which equates to about 20%, excuse me, 26% of our annual budget. And I will tell you, without getting into the details, but 22 is going to get us well north of 26, and 23 is going to be even more. Because we realize that there are capabilities that we have to invest in now to make sure that the great airmen that we have, sailors, soldiers, Marines, when they're conducting missions in the future, they're going to have the modernized capabilities they need in the future, whether that be 25, 26, 27, but the needle's moving. Can I, uh, let me just follow up. You know, one thing that is definitely going to change, I think, uh, across um, probably all the components, again, I'll speak specifically for AFSOC, is, you know, historically, SOF has uh, played a role as a supporting element to the joint force. SOF opens windows of opportunity for the broader joint force. SOF brings unique uh, capabilities, sometimes exquisite capabilities that don't exist elsewhere in the department in support of the broader joint force. Over the last 20 years, in many ways, uh, SOCOM SOF has become the supported force in uh, the counter VEO campaigns that we've been fighting. And so part of what is, what is changing inside of, of AFSOC is this mentality that we need to be thinking about uh, not how do we as AFSOC, not how do we um, uh, be the Air Force component of SOCOM. We've done that for 20 years and we've been fantastic at it. But how do we be the soft component of the Air Force? You know, how do we go from being the Air Force component of SOCOM to being the soft component of the Air Force? Opening windows of advantage for the Joint Force, and, and for us, that's uh, our Department of the Air Force teammates in, in the Air and Space Forces. So, gentlemen, when we look to the future, the security challenges posed by violent extremists uh, will remain constant. How does SOF intend to sustainably address that security challenge as well? Well, from SOCOM's perspective, as the coordinating authority um, for counter-VEO for the Department of Defense, uh, countering violent extremist organizations, that is still one of our top priority um, areas. And even though we're going to have 30, 40 percent of our operations focused on great power competition, that means 60, 70 percent is going to sustain counter-VEO. What it does mean, though, is we're going to stay focused on counter-VEO, but we're also going to make sure that we're using our existing resources against those prioritized threats, those threats that have the capability and the intent to attack our homeland or our national interest. And so we have been laser focused in making sure that we have the right capabilities, the right force structure, and the right partnerships forward. Because this is not only a United States mission, but it's also making sure, or a DOD mission, but it's also making sure that we have all the right partners with us moving forward as we target and disable and disrupt those VEO organizations. And two key partners in that I would highlight are our interagency partners. And SOCOM is blessed to have an outstanding liaison network through the entire governmental, um, DO, um, excuse me, the entire governmental agencies to make sure that we are tightly lashed with our key teammates that are also focused on VEO. And then the second set of teammates that we're uh, tightly lashed with are our allies and partners. Because many of these VEOs are not just attacking U.S. interest and the U.S. homeland, but they're also going after other nations' interest as well. And again, SOCOM is blessed with wonderful allies and partners. In our J3I, our international division of our SOCOM headquarters, we have 28 international partners that live with us, work with us, is on our staff working closely to make sure that all of our VEO operations are closely um, 
coordinated and aligned with their national interest as it moves forward. And we also have a wonderful organization forward base called Operation Gallant Phoenix, where we forward have international partners and interagency partners forward, enabling that key intel sharing for primarily legal finishes. Because at the end of the day, SOCOM's perspective is we're agnostic on the finish. It could be a kinetic finish, but it can be just as effective being a legal finish by another nation holding their personal personnel accountable for the actions that they're moving forward. I would tell you from, a, from an AFSOC perspective, really an Air Force perspective, uh, in the aftermath of 9-11, you know, we did not have, we, the Department of Defense, did not have a, a network targeting methodology. This was something we built in the, in, in the you know, early 2000s. Uh, you know, it really was hitting full uh, stride by 2006, 2007, where we built this uh, a very effective, uh, what some have called surveillance strike complex, where uh, you know we were able to uh, action intelligence on tactically relevant timelines, and that entire surveillance strike methodology that we built after 9/11 was heavily, heavily dependent on air power, and so we would have a, a you know a target that we would surveil with air power. Uh, and when we brought the assault force to bear on those targets, there would be an entire stack of airplanes over the top of that target. You know, close air support, uh, uh, reconnaissance, ISR, jamming, I mean, you name it, there would be a stack of airplanes 10,000 feet um, high over the top of, of these targets. And in the future operating environment, which frankly I would tell you is the current operating environment, uh, that stack of air, of air power uh, is not going to be there. We're not going to be able to rely on having a stack of air power over every single target that needs to be actioned. And so uh, for us, as we think about how are we going to prosecute counter VEO uh, uh, targeting methodologies in the future, from an airman's perspective, it's all about collapsing that stack. Uh, you know, fewer airplanes that are multi-role, that, uh, that have uh, the ability to execute uh, those missions in multiples, uh, that's really a centerpiece of how we envision ourselves prosecuting counter VEO campaigns from an airman's perspective in the future operating environment. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to riff off of that if I could. Um, and that takes us to some of the efforts in SOCOM that we're focusing on in our modernization aspect. And I'd, I'd bring up three major programs that we're focusing on that have direct ties to counter VEO but have collateral effects to the great power competition. The first is, um, as General Slife said, you know, how we're approaching the ISR perspective. We have realized after two decades that we became very air focused, that the sensor had to be in the air. And we're realizing um, with the explosion of other means to collect information, that it's less about the platform and more about the information. So we're one of General Clark's um, top acquisition priorities is what we're calling next generation ISR. And there will be airborne platforms that support this, but it'll also be how do we weave in the information we're getting from the space environment? How are we getting information from the human environment? How are we getting information from the publicly available information environment? And that, that's great, but that's a, that's a flood of information that our great intel professionals have to work with. And that takes us to our second um, focus area. And that's we're investing heavily in making sure that we're moving forward in the world of data our data advantage, data networks, to make sure that we are postured, whether it be in the cloud or whether it be the right algorithms, of how do we bring automation, AI, ML, with the flood of data that's coming forward to give that information in a timely perspective for the operators to make timely decisions as it goes forward. And then the third one I wanna to highlight to General Slife's great point about you know, combining platforms is General Clark's top acquisition priority is Armed Overwatch. As we move forward with Armed Overwatch, it's realizing that we will still have forces on the field that need that ISR to support that ground scheme maneuver, that need that CAS when they need that ability as it moves forward. And so we realize that as the services are girding up to focus more heavily for great power competition, that we have an imperative to make sure that, that we still have aviation platforms that support that need for those isolated teams that may be in West Africa, 
East Africa, somewhere in the Middle East, where we won't have large um, arrays of aircraft overhead. Gentlemen, the term special operations encompasses a large group of professionals with a variety of backgrounds. What is special operations air power to you, and what options will it provide the joint force in the pure fight? Well, uh, so this is something we're actually putting a fair amount of thought into at, uh, at AFSOC. And I would, you know, if I, uh, I, I don't have a dry erase board up here, otherwise I'd put my uh, professor Slife hat on, uh, but I would draw a two-circle uh, Venn diagram, you know, an over, two overlapping circles. And one of those circles would be uh, uh, air power supporting special operations. So if you think of all the things that could fall into a circle that you might describe as air power supporting special operations, you could think of a thousand things, right? It might be a C-17 carrying a rapid response force around the globe. It could be a, a KC-135 refueling a gunship trying to get across the ocean. Uh, it could be an A-10 providing close air support to a team on the ground. Uh, there's a whole host of things that could fall into this category of air power supporting special operations. But that other circle is what, what I would describe as special operations air power. And that's different. Special operations air power is what AFTOC is all about. And so there is a piece in the middle where these two circles overlap. And that piece in the middle is special operations air power supporting special operations, right? It's, that's the overlap. And that's what we have been exclusively focused on for the last 20 years. And so we have a force that nobody beneath the rank of, of colonel or chief master sergeant has lived in an AFSOC that has done anything other than that piece in the middle. Special operations, air power supporting special operations. But I would suggest there's more to special operations air power than supporting somebody on the ground that has a mission they need to do. That's critically important, and we can't ever walk away from that. General Bauernfein talked about this armed overwatch platform. It is tied directly to our need to support our teammates on the ground. But there are special operations that don't have anything to do with somebody on the ground that are entirely, uh, that are entirely air power centric. That is the rest of that circle that exists outside that piece in the middle. And so this is something that we're spending a lot of uh, time focused on. Um, you know, I have a number of examples of, of things that that might look like. I would, I, I would take you back. Here's an early example of what and a special operations mission from the air uh, would, would be. Uh, in early 1942, uh, Jimmy Doolittle uh, had the mission of flying 16 B-25 bombers off the deck of the USS Hornet, right? And so you think about how this mission developed and, and how this was briefed. Okay, here's the plan, Jimmy. We have 16 bombers that we're gonna put on an aircraft carrier. Now, we are pretty sure that they'll be able to take off. Not completely sure, but we're pretty sure that they'll be able to take off. And we're going to drive this aircraft carrier west. And when we get as close as we can get to Japan, you are going to lead these 16 bombers off the end of the USS Hornet. And assuming that we were right and you can actually take off, uh, you will fly west. Now, you can't come back because we have no ability to land on the aircraft carrier. And so you're going to fly west until you get to Tokyo. When you get to Tokyo, you're going to drop your bombs. But now we don't have enough gas to get you anywhere, so you just keep flying west until you get into Japanese-occupied China. When you get into Japanese-occupied China, Jimmy, your airplanes are going to run out of gas. When your airplane runs out of gas, you all are to bail out of your airplanes and land in occupied China. And then you are to link up with the Chinese resistance movement and E&E &E your way across China until you get back to United States hands. Do you have any questions about this mission, Jimmy? Right, I mean, you think about that, that is a special operations mission. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to have an AFSOC patch on. That is a mission that, you know, is completely non-standard. You know, the first missions of Desert Storm were led by AFSOC helicopters. 
Those AFSOC helicopters led a package of Army Apaches into Iraq to destroy the early warning radar sites that allowed the air armada to flow north. This is what I'm talking about when I say we, we play a supporting role to the broader joint force. That was in support of the air component commander. We didn't buy those helicopters to go destroy early warning radar sites. We just used them for that. Right? That's a, an, an application of special operations from the air, uh, independent of somebody moving around on the ground needing, needing examples, uh, need, needing support. In December, AFSOC launched a JASM ER, a long-range stealthy uh, cruise missile, out of the back of a C-130. Flew a long navigation route over the Gulf of Mexico, killed a barge in the Gulf of Mexico. Why in the world would AFSOC be launching cruise missiles out of the back of C-130s? Because if our adversaries have to look at every C-130 and every C-17 and wonder what's in the back and whether that C-17 is in fact a long-range fires platform, it changes their calculus. That's deterrent. That's, that's deterrent. That is an, an application of special operations air power. And so I guess, you know, that's a long way uh, of saying that we are thinking about air power in AFSOC more broadly than purely in what we have done for the last 20 years, which is the necessary but insufficient role of in support of a mission on the ground. From SOCOM's perspective, I would offer a, um, I'm going to take the conversation up a little bit. As we look at our operations, as we look at our programming, we, we bend our operations into four major areas. First is crisis response, no fail crisis response, as we have the capability to respond when the president needs to to a wide variety of missions of which air commandos and many other airmen are involved in and respond perfectly every time because it is so well exercised and so well sequenced and that is a key part of where our soft airmen are involved. The second aspect that we've already talked about is counter VEO. We're not walking away from counter VEO. We are the coordinating authority. We know that we will be still conducting a major part of counter VEO operations along with the joint force in support of those geographic combatant commanders who own the mission, whether it be in AFRICOM, CENTCOM, Indo-PACOM, as we move forward. But the other two I want to delve into a little bit. The third one is competition. And that is that irregular warfare, that unconventional warfare, where special operations provides very unique capabilities for the nation. And that's to General Slice's great point on the um, JASMs. We provide low cost, low escalatory options for national leaders because we have the ability with our special operations forces to hold adversary systems at risk. We get after their strategic decision making. And through that capability, there is a wide scope of opportunity for soft airmen to be involved. And then the final case, which is pure to the entire joint force, is conflict. And to that supporting role, we realize at SOCOM that we are in support of the joint force when we go to conflict as it goes forward. But we also know that for us to be prepared, we have to be on the battlefield early, we have to be preparing the environment, and we have to make sure that we are providing those options, whether it be on the ground, in the sea, in the air, in other domains, to hold those adversary systems at risk. Because we're seeing it right now in real time in Europe, where this dance amongst nuclear powers is a very careful dance. And so from the Department of Defense, we owe our national leaders very nuanced options so they can start to have those strategic decisions. And from General Clark's perspective, my perspective at SOCOM, um, soft airmen absolutely are a part of all of those options moving forward. General Seip, uh, picking up uh, something uh, General Bowen find uh, mentioned, Last year, AFSOC uh, personnel deployed to more than 60 countries. You also held a building partner 
uh, aviation capacity uh, seminar at Hurlburt. How do these uh, frequent deployments and partnership seminars build value, and how do the uh, how do these actions align with the larger effort to build and re build our reach in informal networks that we can leverage later? I, <clears throat> so I'm going to uh, answer the question uh, kind of broadly about uh, building partner aviation capacity. So there is, you know, first of all, uh, General Bauernfein highlighted the point that one of SOCOM's uh, uh, competitive advantages is what I would describe it is a, is a vast. Uh, set of international relationships, and you know, SOF is deployed around the globe. AFSOC certainly no different. Uh, deployed around the globe, uh, engaged with um, with with various partners, and a portion of that is built around the idea of building partner capacity. We are helping them develop the capabilities that they need to be most effective in their security environment, whatever you know, whatever part of the world they're in. But the other part of that is the access and the influence that those engagements provide, right? If we are in 60 places around the globe, that's 60 places where the United States has some level of access and some level of influence, uh, has the ability to understand the environment. You know, uh, th those are really, really valuable opportunities. And what we in AFSOC have been limited by over time is our, our limited density of aviation advisors. We haven't had enough capacity to engage meaningfully in as many places as we want to engage around the globe. And so one of the things that we're uh, 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 working through pretty diligently is how do we expand that capacity across AFSOC and provide more access vectors uh, to all of our operating forces um, all around the globe. Um, so I, I, I think the, the um, access and uh, influence around the globe is the, is the critical part of that, and we're expanding our, our investment in that. You know, that's one of the value propositions of, of SOF, certainly, but AFSOC inside the Air Force, is the ability to operate across the spectrum of visibility and attribution. The ability to operate across a spectrum of visibility and attribution. So there are some things that we do that are very visible and highly attributable, right? When a C-130 with a 105 millimeter cannon sticking out of the side shows up, it, it, it's pretty attributable, right? There are other things that we do that are much less visible and much less attributable. And the ability to operate across that whole spectrum to gain and leverage access and influence around the globe is a central part of our value proposition for the future. And so those, you know, those forces inside of AFSOC that provide access and, and influence around the globe at whatever level of attribution is, uh, are, are important investment areas for us. If I may, I'd like to join in on that one. And I want to tie this to uh, the SecDef's uh, number three priority, succeed through teamwork. And you know what he mean? What Secretary Austin has meant by that is you know teamwork amongst the services, teamwork amongst the NRAC, but most importantly, teamwork with our allies and partners. And we have learned that at SOCOM, as I already mentioned, our great J3I teammates, our great um, the folks that we have forward um, at many many um, locations. But it comes to a, a kind of a bumper um, a bumper sticker statement that you can't surge trust. And that was what we talk about is how you have to be on the field to compete. You have to be forward. You have to be preparing the environment. Doesn't mean you have to be forward 24-7, 365, but you have to be developing those relationships globally with those allies and partners that are like-minded in the international world order. And SOCOM has been highly successful of that, mostly, not mostly, across all of our services, but especially in AFSOC. I will tell you, just right now, you know, in the Ukrainian operation, there, the phones are lighting up with many of our Ukrainian teammates who served with many of our Army teammates. Some are in PME now, and the connections are going very strongly as we maintain those, you know, relationships uh, as we go forward. But it was just in our history at AFSOC, I would point out that it was relationships that was maintained with nations to the north of Afghanistan that were critical to opening up that northern air bridge when we needed those mobility forces to flow from the north early in the war on Afghanistan. 
And there are literally dozens of examples, whether it be from small teams being forward conducting training with partner air forces, or whether it be teammates back in PME or at foreign, or at foreign PME, that those relationships last, last a lifetime. And you just never know when you're going to need those relationships. So it's important that, that we continue on those and the um, efforts of AFSOC in building those is critical to SOCOM success. General Bauernfeind, uh, what areas does SOCOM need support from Congress and industry as it shifts to this focus on uh, the near peer fight and uh, while obviously sustaining uh, pressure on VEOs as well? Well, um, from SOCOM's perspective, we just want to thank Congress. I will tell you that we have been receiving amazing support from Congress across the board. And primarily, we work with just, just like everyone else, but the six committees, the HASC, the SAS, the HAC, the SAC, HIPSI, SISI, those members and those professional staff members have been exceptionally supportive of all of SOCOM's efforts. So we just want to say thank you for that. Yes, they hold their oversight role tight and they ask us the hard questions, which is their responsibility to do, and we welcome those questions. And we appreciate that going forward. But at the end of the day, we know it's because they're taking such good support for us. As an example, um, we have benefited greatly from specialized authorities in SOCOM, whether it be our um, 1202 or our 127 ECHO authorities, just numbers in a Title um, 10 U.S. Code, but really what that gives us the authority on SECDEF approval is to develop partner irregular forces around the world, so it's not just U.S. forces as we're going forward. We also have been given, through our specialized acquisition capabilities, special authorities with small businesses. And I just want to pull up a quick uh, stat there, as I had it in, a, in my head, that you know, during that um, specialized um, business, excuse me, that specialized acquisition authority, we were able to quadruple the amount of money we were spending with small businesses. So we went from five million to 20 million, and we increased. Um, we increased the capabilities for many of those small businesses by over 240%, much faster deliveries. Because what we're finding is in the data world, in the software world, in where a lot of innovation lives are in these small businesses. And we're seeing great results of specialized authorities like that that we're getting from Congress. So as long as we continue getting that support, we're, you know, no additional ask, at least from my position. I'm sure General Clark will have more when he testifies here in about uh, six weeks. And then for industry, I just want to also say thanks for everything that industry is doing, because industry is pushing us forward. Industry is continuing to come to the table with great ideas. They're continuing to challenge us, whether it be our great acquisition executive, Mr. Jim Smith, and his amazing PEOs, but we have a whole host of wonderful industry partners that when we're putting requests for proposals out there, great concepts are coming forward, and we're tying them with the warfighters, and we're getting great capabilities as we move forward. So that's all we'd ask is that for industry to keep pushing on that. General Slyke, do you have a, a thought on this as well? Um, uh, you, not specifically on the what Congress can do. I mean, we um, obviously we, we rely on Congress for you know support to all these programs we're talking about. Uh, look forward to continuing that that conversation. Uh, but as General Bauernfein said, uh, you know while while. Um, you know, Congress asks us more questions than we would like sometimes. Uh, they're never the wrong questions. And uh, so, um, I, you know, I wouldn't ask for anything other than, than what they're doing, which is exercising their oversight role and, and uh, where warranted supporting, supporting our programs. On the, on the industry side, you know, I, I would say uh, AFSOC benefits from living at the intersection of the U.S. Air Force as a MAGCOM and uh, U.S. SOCOM as a, as a service component. Uh, we are able to leverage our, you know, kind of vast uh, um, service acquisition architecture um, while also leveraging the rapid pace at which SOCOM acquisition can turn. And we can, we can blend those things together. And most of the programs that we execute inside of, of AFSOC are a combination of SOCOM and Air Force acquisition authorities coming coming forward to help us go pretty quickly. You know, the cruise missile out of the back of a C-130, that example, that happened because of the partnership of uh, AFRL and the SOCOM acquisition team that were able to uh, make that happen in a 
remarkably short period of time. So um, that's, I, I think that's where I would stand on that. Well, gentlemen, on behalf of the AFA and our standing room only audience uh, participants, I want to thank you so much for the time you've given us and the insights. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Bye.